right, folks, let's go. Let's get it started. Thursday, I, April 11th, at the end of a, you know, a very chill week, nothing big really happened. <laughs> at the end of this, another crazy week in AI, of course, and they've been getting crazier. There was this one Wednesday, or I guess one Tuesday, that we got to talk about because it's just so much happened. Uh, as always, you're on Thursday AI. We here every Thursday to talk about latest and greatest in AI news, uh, whether the weeks don't have that much or the weeks are as crazy as this one was. And I will just want to say hi to the folks here on stage, my co-hosts and guest expert speakers. First of all, LDJ joined us. LDJ, welcome, welcome. Uh, you have some stuff that you participated in. If, if inadvertently, I guess, that we're going to chat about, feel free to say hi to the folks as well. Yeah. Hey, everybody. I guess we, you want me to mention what that thing is right now, or we're going to keep it a surprise for later? No, we're going to, uh, it's almost breaking news, right? It came out today, so we can count this as breaking news. And then I also want to say hi to Jan Peleg. Jan, welcome as well. Feel free to say hi to the folks. How are you doing? We're doing, doing? <laughs> very, very excited and energetic to talk about everything oh, yeah. that we got. Oh, yeah. And there's a few stuff that I think I didn't actually add to my notes, but the, the Gemma stuff, the, the kind of the non-transformer Gemma stuff, I would love to chat with you about because I don't think I've had the attention spent to look at those as well, but I saw you, you got a little bit excited there. And also, Justin, we already said hi to Justin, but now we're recording. Justin, welcome. Yeah, hi, everyone. Yeah, hi. I'm but Justin from the Quentin. Yeah. Justin from the Quant team, and we've been covering multiple things together. Let me add a few more folks here as guests of the pod. And basically, if you haven't tuned in to us, and I know I see a lot of new faces here. If you haven't tuned in ever, this is Thursday AI, where we talk about AI things every week. There's another friend that I just added, Matt Schumer. Matt, welcome as well. Hey, thanks for having me. Thank you for joining. We should add you to the group chat. I don't know why you're, you're not in the group chat. This is, you're basically here almost every week now, which is great. And we have an exciting show, folks. I don't know, sh sh should I run a little recap or should we get just started? Yeah, I'll just do a little recap of everything that we're going to talk about while folks plug in. Here's the recap of everything we've talked about on april 11th thursday i show my name is alex volkov from weights and biases and we had an incredibly packed kind of discussion we didn't even have a, a scheduled guest but we did have surprise guests and some breaking news so let, let's run through everything that we've talked about so in the open source llms area the the one that we love we talked about this for almost an hour and a half obviously the hugest news is like a new there's two pieces of huge news from the beginning of the week. Command R Plus jumped to number six on the LMCs arena. And the first time we saw an open weights model BGPT4, we also covered with our friend of the pod here from Alibaba from the Quen team that Quen 1.532 billion also jumped to number 12 in the LMCs arena. This was from the beginning of the week, some updates to the arena. And then we've talked about like the hugest news that Mistral just gave us a new torrent file, just tweeted a torrent link and everybody started to download the scrambled. And what's, what, what was waiting for us inside is a new Mistral, which we started called Bigstral because it's a bigger version of the previous uh, MOE from Mistral. This one is an eight times 22 billion parameter MOE with an Apache 2 license. And it's a base model with 66,000 tokens in the context window. And you download the magnet link. It shows incredible scores for a base model. So it beats Command R, the one that I just talked about, beat, like jumped over GPT-4. It beats Command R on the MMLU score. And folks are trying to evaluate this base model, which is for a base model is very impressive. Obviously, Apache 2 license. So we do expect, we covered, we did a little pr prediction segment and we said that, hey, Let's see how big this model will perform in the LMC Serena. And then we already saw that the first fine tunes are already in oven. And we had some folks who actually started to fine tune this Matt Schumer and then Eric Harford. And we actually had breaking news afterwards that 
the first fine tune was released the, like a few minutes before we started to run the show from Hagen Face and Argia and the folks from Kaist AI from from Korean Institute of Technology AI and then LDJ because they're friends of his apparently and also they used Capybara or like a distilled version of Capybara. LDJ reached out and we actually had uh, impromptu, which is the best part, impromptu interview with the folks who are behind the first fine tune of Mixtrol or Bixtrol, Jiwoo Hong and Noah Lee from the Kai, Kai State AI. They used a technique called Orpo. So these guys are also authors of this Orpo paper of, of how to train these models with reduced, significantly reduced hardware overhead. So a great conversation. If you want to listen to that, please tune in. I, I really enjoyed and I love impromptu conversation with the folks who, who make the news. We then also talked about the Gemma team at Google giving us multiple things, I think three new announcements. So they've updated the Gemma Instruct version. So we now got Gemma Instruct 1.1. So two models, the two billion parameter area and the seven-ish. So the previous series, uh, Gemma 7B, but it's not really 7B, it's like more like 8.5. But we got an Instruct update, I think a quite an impressive improvement for, for both of them. We also got code Gemma, which is like two fine tuned specifically for code. We also then covered something called recurrent Gemma, which is a completely new kind of architecture based on uh, recurrent neural networks. And we've covered this with Yam about what does this mean and how it's closer to sound like a RWKV, for example, and very impressive that Google is trying to give new architectures. This one specifically reduces overhead uh, for longer contexts and reduces the hardware required to run it. And it's very interesting that Google is playing around in this area of, of newer architectures or different architectures. We also covered the Auto Code Rover agent, the new kind of agent on the block that beats the SWE bench benchmark, which is a hard benchmark uh, that needs multiple steps to complete the task. So we previously covered Devon, and then we covered last week, we covered SWE agent with 17%. This new agent called AutoCode Rover gets 22% on this very hard task, and which is very impressive. The jumps from Claude Opus getting 4%, and then Devin gets 13%. Sui agent from last week gets 17 and now this one gets like 22 The jumps are quite incredible. We also covered a very specific uh, use case of something like Devin with Junaid and, and Swix collaborating on an, uh, Devin participating in Junaid's GitHub repo. Very interesting conversation of like actual world practical uses of something like Devin. And that's pretty much it in the open source thing. We also briefly ch had a chat about Sophia, which is a potential competitor for the Adam W optimizer. If you're into this stuff, if you know what Adam W is, definitely listen to this because it could be very exciting. Then we switched into the big companies and LLMs and APIs, where we covered that OpenAI released a new GPT-4 for us, a new GPT-4 Turbo version. And that one is... GPT-4 Turbo 2024 0409, April 9th version. They first started adding a year to the releases because now they've lapped a year. But also the fact that OpenAI just said it's majorly improved and didn't mention anything else. And then we chatted with folks and highlighted some examples of folks who actually did use this model and it is significantly better, at least on math. Very impressive. And we also saw some folks doing comparison side by side on something like a code generator usage cursor. And we did get significantly improved GPT-4 yesterday, in addition to everything else. Then in the big companies, also a huge announcement from Google, where Gemini 1.5, the model that gets 1 million tokens in the context window, is now free. So you can use it for free. It's open in more than 180 countries, and it significantly improved on kind of the capabilities. It now understands audio, so you can upload a audio file into it and have it like React, I actually shared an example where I shared last week's Thursday I recording audio file, just MP3, and asked it to analyze and give me like the best snippets, everything we talked about, and it did it in around 40 seconds. It also introduced a new API for unlimited file upload, so up to two gigabyte files, something that only Google can probably do very easily. And also they updated like acting on your commands with system prompts and JSON mode. So all of these things, one thing that we didn't mention in the chat, but I really want to mention in the TLDR is that you can now turn off the safety filters. Previously, you could like only set them to low. It looks like now you can turn them off completely. The safety filters, you need to agree to the terms and conditions, but you can now like lower the safety filters completely. It looks like Google is listening to our feedback. And also they have a new embedding model that they call text embedding 004, which is funny. Then we covered that Llama 3 is coming soon. Now we actually have a confir confirmation that we've talked about that Llama 3 is coming very soon and it's going to probably get released in parts. We also talked about it being potentially multimodal. 
And then I also chatted about the Grok uh, productizations. X is now using Grok, their AI model, to actually summarize the news and give you the new summaries on top of kind of the collection of the news that, that you want. And I read out some of mine, and mine are really like focused on the stuff that I like to talk about, AI specifically. And then also that Elon Musk were in a space and talked about Grok 2 is coming maybe in May, and Grok 3 by end of this year, and we'll need something like 100,000 H100s to scale, which is pretty much the electrical requirements of a small city or something like this. It's, it's quite crazy. And then we switched to the last piece of what we wanted to talk about in the voice and audio category, because this week was, it looks like the renaissance or the ChatGPT moment for AI music. This week we saw a release of a, a new company, a new product called Udio, which is a few folks from DeepMind and A16Z invested in them, like a very slick release with text to audio that some say that beats Suno and it can create intros and outros and continue songs and has AI enhancing prompts. So if you write something and you're not quite the prompt master in creating songs, they, they have an AI that enhances some prompts, which is incredible. And then we also talked about Hagen Face release a new text-to-speech trainer called Parler TTS, a very beginning model with 300 million parameters, but it's open source completely. And then they use 10,000 hours of data and you can now train different text-to-speech voices in the open. It's, so I think it's time to talk about the most important thing here is open source. Open source AI, let's get it started. Let's get it started. All right, folks, should we do it by order of things happening in the week or should we do it by order of importance? I actually don't know. I do want to cover, yeah, my, I do want to cover the Commander Plus jumping onto number six on LMCs. Let's talk about this one because I saw you, you were celebrating this as much as I was. This is an insane, an insane moment, seriously. Many people were skeptic that it will ever happen. Many people knew that someday it will happen. But at the end of the day, it happens. You have a model that is uh, at least on par, at least on par to GPT-4. Being, being better is, I think, start to be subjectively mm -hmm. better at this point, I think. But at least it's on the same ballpark, that's for sure. But just know that it's GPT-4 from last year. This is what we are talking about. Yes. You can run it. I, I for sure run models that are larger than this on two GPUs with eight, with 48 gigabytes, but you might be able to run it on even smaller amount of VRAM. So it definitely is within reach if you have the GPUs, which not, is not that trivial, but it is within reach and it's, uh, it's an amazing moment. One thing to note, it's important to say that allegedly it's just 6% uh, of the size of GPT-4. So there is a trend that models get much more efficient in terms of number of parameters over time. And there is a clear trend uh, for this. Um, and it's amazing. It's an amazing moment, I think. We all waited for this to happen for a long time. And, it's quite uh, crazy. <laughs> and it's a little bit surprising, I must say. Everyone knew that Cohere is a strong, you know, a strong lab. They got really good people. But you know, we didn't get too many open source releases from them. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden we get a model that is, is stick on, on LMC, so it's amazing. And it's a smaller I, brother is 11th on LMC, right? So Commandar is also going a very good appearance on LMC and it's significantly smaller model as well. I think it's like 32 uh, billion parameters or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Absolute great show from Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Not to mention that this model is also very enterprise focused as well. So like folks can actually, it's not commercial by license, but you can use it. You can use it through Cohere. You can use it through their services. And they even said that they will work with you if you are a startup and you want to fine tune this model. They will work with you and let you do some stuff with it. And th this model supports multi-turn tool use. So JSON mode and tool use multi-turn. It supports multiple languages as well. I think it's like uh, some folks said this is very decent in like things like Hebrew and Italian. It's and really Spanish. good at Hebrew. It's really good at really Hebrew. Really good. So mm -hmm. it, it's really impressive like how good this model is now. And this is like the best open weight model in there. There was a few more updates there that Justin, I want to tag you on because at the same kind of day that Commandar jumped on top of GPT-4 and let's just say this, right? The GPT-4 
preview and we're not even talking about the one that we're going to cover matt hopefully <laughs> the, the release like two days ago but gpt4 turbo from 1106 and 0125 so this this year they're still on top they're still very close to cloud opus we're talking about gpt4 from exactly last year the one the the first release 0314 and also 0613 the one from june but just i want to tag you because the same update that, that showed that command r jumped in the in the forks also showed that quen 1.5 chat 32 billion parameters is also like very close up there like number 12 did you guys celebrate this uh, update did you guys expect it because you have quen 72 billion parameters number 10 but at number 12 a very small model like 32 billion parameters model is up there yeah uh, i think it is consistent with our expectation of our 32 billion parameter model because uh, our 72 billion parameter model is actually a month ago. Well, uh, it is developing very, very fast. And we have some techniques improving our chat models because, you know, today, uh, if you really want to improve your post training, there are a lot of techniques that you need to try and you can train very good models uh, with relatively lower cost, not just like pre-training. But if you work on pre-training, you have to spend a lot of time and a lot of compute, but for post-training, you can improve it. So it is consistent with our expectation. I think Command R, especially Plus, is really consistent with our expectation of the model at that side. It is a really good model. And even Command R, compared with 32 billion, you can see that it is 10 points higher than 32 billion. Uh, I think that there is some room for us to further improve because we have similar sizes. And for Command R Plus with 104 billion, we have models internally of similar sizes. And I think for the the uh, Arena ELO score, can, we use the MT bench score to compare with it. I, I think you know, it's a very fair performance. Yeah, I think Command R, R Plus is... It's a very excellent model. Absolutely. It deserves it. Yeah. It deserves yeah. it. And congrats to you guys of holding your, your ground there on the LNCS Arena. We expect to see more stuff from you. Uh, so moving on. So this is Commandar. Shout out to them. This is like a huge moment. Like the first time that even something beat the GPT-4 and like multiple things. Uh, as we just covered like a, a few weeks ago, the, the first time something beat GPT-3.5 on, on multiple things. And that something is still up there. It's lower now in ranking, but that, that model is still up there. It's a 7B model called Starling. And it's really good. And I wish Nissan was here to hype it up a little bit more because he, he, he loves that model. But Starling, which is a fine tune of Open Chat, which is fine tune of Mistral 7B, now an eight months old, seven billion parameter model, is still up there. And we're still waiting for the updated 0 0.2 Mistral 7B to, to get up there. So, with that said, there's one more thing we want to cover in. in no, actually, we'll cover this later. Um, Mistral released a new torrent for us out of the blue, and everybody, everybody's in in our field. This is a celebratory day when Mistral releases another, you know, another magnet link, which seems to be the thing. They haven't released any blog post yet. I haven't seen. They haven't released any technical details. But basically, they they gave us a torrent link, and folks started downloading this very fast. What did we get, Matt uh, and LDJ? You're more than welcome to cover this, Matt. Maybe start first. What did we get from this torrent? Did you download this yourself? I saw you were a little sick. Yeah, still am, but it's not too bad. Basically, we got a mixture of experts model that's very similar to Mixtral, but 22 billion parameter experts rather than 7 billion, which is a huge step up. And obviously, it's a newer model, probably trained on better, newer data, more compute. It's a pretty awesome model. But I think the key thing here is it's the first time we've had a open source commercial usable. That's a distinction from Cohere's model. Because Cohere model, Cohere's model, and we're a big partner of theirs, is amazing. But it's the first time we've had an open source commercially usable model that competes with base GPT-4. So that's the one big thing, right? If you're able to fine tune this in any capacity, and we're working on this now, you can get insane results from it. Even prompting, right? Very similar to how you can prompt Haiku with many examples and get a really great output. It's similar to fine tuning for a task. You can do the same thing here, which is pretty insane. For example, this thing was not trained to be an instruct model, but I was able to pass in actually data directly from a training data set I had with function calling, and just 10 examples got it to the point with the base promptable model to be able to essentially do function calling like it was a assistant tune model, which would have taken tons more compute, which is crazy on its own. It's crazy um, on its own, right? <laughs> that you can get a base yeah, model yeah. to align with some prompting techniques. Yeah, it absolutely is. And then you've been around in the space since the GPT-3 days. Um, a lot of people are like coming in later, but 
if you remember the early GPT-3 days, you were able to get such interesting results from the model because it wasn't instruction tuned, it wasn't assistant tuned, mm-hmm. it wasn't RLHF to death. And so we had access at the other side to GPT-4 for many months before it was released, and it wasn't the, the assistant tuned model, it was the base or something pretty close to it. And the outputs you were able to get were actually in many ways much better. It was harder to get them, the prompting was more intensive, but if you prompt it, the outputs are amazing because the model isn't stuck in its ways, which is what assistant tuning RLHF does. Um, so this is the first time we've had a base model released of this scale. And it feels very similar. Like I'll tell you, it's feeling very similar in terms of its capabilities, in terms of how it behaves to the original GPT-4 that was the pre-release version, which was an amazing model. So yeah, I think this is a huge step up for open source, for commercial usability. Now any company has the ability to take a little bit of compute, maybe eight H100s, which aren't easy to find, but it's not insanely expensive. You can just ask. Something that you can just ask Hagen Face, and they'll give it to you. <laughs> Some people are like that. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was really nice of them. Uh, we're using that for actually inference, working with another one of our partners on compute. But yeah, it, you can take a little bit of compute, apply it to the model because it's so big. You don't need as much time of training. You don't need as many examples. So even though it might seem more expensive to train something like this, it actually isn't because. You can do it with far less in terms of examples, in terms of compute, uh, if you want. It doesn't do the exact same thing that a big data set would do, but it's pretty close, and you'll get an amazing result. So, yeah, it's a huge step forward for open source. That's incredible. So, folks, we got a new torrent from Mixtral. From Mistral. It's called Mixtral. <laughs> At least some of us say Big Stroll because it's like the big Mixtral 8 times 7B. So, 22 billion parameters per expert, 100 and... I want to say 70 billion, 100. I, I don't know. My number here is incorrect, but the total one, I'm not even sure about. It's Apache 2 license confirmed by the folks at, I think, Sophia Yang, I think is the dev role there, confirmed that it's Apache 2 license, which is incredible. You can use this model and do whatever you want with it. It's a base model, like Matt Schumer said just now, which is, we just talked about the model is not a base model. One of the Technion, one of the folks from News Research and a friend of the pod, he keeps complaining about Cohere. He says it's a great model, but it's not based model. So fine tuning it is like a little different. So we got like a base model. Not only that, it folks started running evals on this. And LDJ, maybe you already saw the, the evals already. We got 77.3% on MMLU score from a base model, which beats, I think it, it beats Command R. Because Command R got 75 with, with the instruction. So you want to talk about a little bit about kind of the performance? Yeah, the performance is pretty impressive. I think we're all really waiting to see the instruct models against each other, you know, something like DBRX base model and Mixtral and like Command R plus, like all trained on like the same fine tuning data set and see how they compare. So we got, I think the first folks on Hugging Face that released it, there's like the standard benchmarks. I haven't seen human eval yet. But the Hello Swag beats Cohere, Command R. The Arc one is like very close to it as well. Truthful QA is 52, which is not incredible. But everything else is like basically better on the base model. And we're still waiting for, we're, we're still like actively waiting for, sort of for the first fine tones, which we got today. So I just want to cover like the base model in addition to this as well. Yeah, any other things to. First of all, what's your reaction to this, Yam? And feel free to add any other things about Bixel that you want. This is, I would have, I don't know, a bit of reaction if I could actually run it myself and test it, but, uh, but it's, it was a complete surprise, to, to be honest. And, and I'm sure it's a really good model. I'm just sure. One more thing that people had in, that you didn't mention is that there, is a, there was an interesting result this week in one paper that hints that Mistral might be trained bidirectionally. And it might be a trick because in contrast to everything, every single other model of its size, it doesn't get confused if you remove the directional mask while, while using it. The, the activation doesn't change much. So it might be one of the tricks Mistrals are using so all their models are so good. And I just wanted to point it, point it out. It's not confirmed, it's just, just an interesting result that people might uh, look into. And uh, I'm sure that the model Big Stroll is, is, is just amazing, I'm sure. They don't release stuff just for, for, for you know, if they don't have anything to say. Uh, Mixtral definitely, uh, with Mixtral, with the first one, I think this is the first MOE, a very significant MOE that we got, right? Uh, and then everybody started releasing MOEs. And then also Mixtral 7B is still like- even, the- even the leak 
for Mistral is a really good model. Even the leak, even BQ is Mickey, a really good yeah. model. So everything comes up for Mistral is really good. So uh, I think that uh, it's fair to say that so, even without trying it, it's probably a really good model. Yeah, so for folks who have no idea what Miku is, we 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 saw like this surprising model that beat uh, many other uh, things on the leaderboards, and then suddenly, like after a while, folks were ske- speculating whether or not that's like from Mistral or not, and it was called Miku. And then Arthur Mensch confirmed that it, it's a, like an old model of theirs, and even that one was like very performant, uh, was very impressive as a model. And uh, let's maybe talk about the genealogy of this, folks thought because mistral has their api service called the chat right and they serve mistral large and mistral medium and mistral next whatever and folks are started speculating whether this is one of those and basically i think mistral confirmed that no this is like a completely new model for us that they released a completely new, not one of those and even looking at the benchmarks it's not as performant on arcc as the mistral large one or even the mmlu which is yeah mistral large gets 81 on the mmlu score so a completely new model and now i think we have breaking news from today because like it took less ai breaking news coming at you only <laughs> thursday I- so the best thing about models that are open source and are released to us is obviously the fine tuning ability in the community. So a lot of the a lot of the folks that join this space specifically are folks who are fine tuning. So Matt, I, I noticed that you already started like looking into this. Yam, you, <laughs> you said if you can run this, and then we already got a first fine tune, folks, which is like what, less than twenty four hours since the model released, which is nuts, right? Maybe less than forty eight hours than, than the first model release. So this is the breaking news from today. Zephyr one point one forty one billion parameters. They also call this A thirty five B. So Zephyr from Hagen Face and Argia and the KAIS, the Korean Institute of Science and Technology, I think, they now released a fine tune less than 48 hours after Big Store release. And they, yeah, let me go and find this. They chained it on the Capybara data set that uh, we have the author of here. Uh, so LDJ, if you want to chime in on, on this, and I think we're waiting for some guests maybe from KAIS to, to maybe talk about this technique. But let's also talk about the technique that they used to do this like super fast. Yeah, Capybara is just a data set that has been used to train a few models. It's just really focused on relatively low quantity. It's the whole thing is like less than 20,000 examples, less than 20,000 conversations. But each of those have a lot of back and forth going on in a single conversation, sometimes follow up questions asked by the model and things like that. And it just focused on like very high quality and very quality dense. So it seems like they were able to train it really fast in part because of that. And then also Jiwoo, who's coming up right now, he developed the method or he's one of the authors that worked on a method called ORPO. Um, I think I got that right. Yeah, ORPO. And that paired with Capybara seems to work really well as well and like further boosting the abilities of what the model can do. This is definitely not the last one that we're going to see. We're going to see like many fine tunes. One thing I did want to talk about is the size. Like these latest models, they're like beating GPT-4, GPT-3. They're all big. Like we saw the Databricks one, the model was very big. And then obviously the Command R Plus. And now we're also getting like a big stroll. None of these things are consumer grade able to run on our machines but still these are like incredible models that folks can actually run on production so matt any updates on the fine-tuning front or anything that you're excited specifically to see from this base model to perform yeah tried for a while yesterday actually was working with maintainer of axolotl in case oh it looks like he's here actually yeah wing is here let's uh, bring wing up wing if you want to if you want to <laughs> if you want to come up and say hi to us please welcome uh, go ahead Matt. sorry no yeah all good was working on it for a while yesterday, having some issues with Qlora, Laura, but actually was able to get a full fine tune working as long as I freeze most of the layers. That seemed to work pretty well. Funny enough, I'm actually working with eight, eight, eight H100s and the bottleneck actually isn't training. It's actually enough RAM to save the model at the end. So it finishes training and it crashes. Training is possible for sure. And it doesn't require nearly as much in terms of resources as I expected. Still quite a bit. It's a big model. But yeah, it's more about like right now, just figuring out how to save the model, which is a bit of an issue, but it seems like we'll be able to overcome it pretty quickly. But the curious thing about it was watching the, the loss and the eval loss. 
it learns much faster than other models are trained, much faster, even faster than, you know, really? mixed roll by far. So it was interesting, you know, with mixed roll for the sort of thing I was doing with it, I have a multi-stage training setup where, you know, first I'll train on a lot of data and then a little bit less, it's higher quality, a little bit less, it's higher quality. Just to experiment with this, I went straight to the final small, let's say, thousand or so example data set, highest quality. And it seems to have just grokked it, or not completely, but really close, which I was just blown away by, right? I feel like I might not even need to do this other stages, which is something I've never seen before. But it makes sense. It's a really powerful model. Wow. So I want to also shout out Wing Lian here on stage, the maintainer of Axelotl. Axel is the toolkit that pretty much everybody uses to fine-tune models these days. Wing, welcome. Feel free to unmute and say hi and, and give us some reactions on uh, Mixtral because I'm sure that many folks like reached out to you and said, hey, help us fine-tune this beast. <laughs> hey, guys. Hey, Alex. Yeah, like I said, Mixtral is a beast and it's, it's almost as hard as the Databricks model to get fine-tuned, mostly because it's so large it just doesn't fit on any of these GPUs you can get on the cloud unless you get multi-node. I think if you look at like the Zephyr Fixtral model, it, they used, I think it, they said they used what, four 80 gig nodes. So that's 32 GPUs and like just insane amounts of the system RAM probably, right? Mm -hmm. I've been experimenting on, typically you can, you could probably get it running on A6000s using FSDP, but all of the cloud GPUs there just simply don't have enough system RAM. I think most of them now are limited to even on RunPad only have 50 gigs. They used to, um, provide like A6000s with 125 gigs of system RAM per GPU. They cut that back. I think they just shifted that RAM around to like their L40Ss and L40s. But And right now you can't get any of those. So it's a slog trying to find what's what's possible with on these smaller GPUs to get a fine-tune. Um, but yeah, I think we're close. I think deep speed is probably the most reasonable way to do it right now. Um, FSDP just requires too much uh, system RAM, just shuffling around the uh, parameters. Yeah. Incredible. So f first of all, Wing, thanks for coming up and obviously shout out to this incredible work that you're doing for the open source community and the fine tuners community. I got to wonder like if, if we should, we talked about it's hard to fine tune. Definitely we'll get there. Like folks, we'll get to the point where like it's possible where it looks like RAM restricted at this point. So Matt, ho hopefully folks who are building these uh, platforms are listening in and allowing for some more more system RAM for this. So that's a great highlight. I also want to talk about like the, the ability to run this model. Obviously not for consumer hardware. This is more more, more significant than this. However, I want to highlight that, that Nistin, who's, I think it's the first time he's not been on Thursday I, but a co-host here on Thursday I, he was able to run this on CPU only using some Llama CPP and just tune tuning kernels. So I just want to highlight this effort from Nistin because it, it's quite incredible. So is he was able to run this uh, model on inference with nine tokens a second, which is fairly usable, nine to tokens a second. But folks in the audience, if you're listening to this, none of this means anything to me. You can also try Big Stroll already at Perplexity and together already has a version of Big Stroll kind of up. And as Matt said, this is only the base model. It's not instruction fine-tuned yet. It's not a lot of stuff that is going to be very helpful for you for. But it's, you know, if you have a MacBook that's 128 gigabytes, you could run this model locally. And this is very likely, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but like looking at everything we're seeing, comparing this to Command R and Benchmarks, this is very likely to beat the GPT-4 from last year, correct? Like we're looking at something yeah, like... I think, yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. And so mm -hmm. we're at this moment where you could run this on the MacBook. If you have the very top level MacBook, you still, you could probably run this. I find all of this. I, like I also really. think that I also think that it'll be still to be to a smaller model, a little bit smaller that'll stay within the same ballpark of performance. It's already been distilled. They uh, people are carrying out the expert themselves of the model. I didn't check them yet, but people have Mistral twenty two Bs floating around on Hugging Face. Wait, they took uh, they distilled it to just one expert. That's twenty two billion. Yeah, well, <laughs> the, the thing is that the model is built from eight Mistral twenty two B. So people are looking at this and just saying, "Wait, I can just take one of the experts and use that, and this I can use and fine tune on my machine. Maybe it's a good one because it's you know it's inside the same model, and, and there are experts floating around now, and people are trying them. But moreover, I think that the, the whole model will be a little bit trimmed, distilled, I don't know, frunk and merge or whatever, just to be able to run on smaller machines because people are going to want to run it. And it's probably a really good model. We are just starting out. It's just 
We are very early. early? Just what we released yesterday. Yesterday, yeah. <laughs> very early and very excited because we got it's basically Christmas for for us folks in, in this area because oh yeah. Uh, Mistral doesn't doesn't play around and Yam, I think you're right. Like this, uh, the previous Mistral was eight. Uh, it was like each expert was activated from the seven billion parameter Mistral that we got before. Here we still haven't had them actually put up a blog post or anything, which I will talk about as well. But yeah, we didn't get any twenty two billion parameter model from Mistral before, right? We didn't have a dense model from Mistral that's twenty two B. And it looks like people are trying to extract the one or, or merge some some layers or something. I, I haven't seen this, but it's great. It's great to to see that that you did. All right, folks. I think we covered Mr. a little bit. Uh, LDJ, uh, Justin, any other comments? It looks like we're trying to bring the the, the folks from the fine tune up. It doesn't work. <laughs> um, Space doesn't want to play with us, but any other comments about Mixtral or any other expectations coming up for, for the next? Uh, I'm sure the weekend is going to be very interesting. Yeah. Last thing I want to say. Is what are your guys' predictions for where it will land? Let's say, like, where the the official Mixtral 141B instruct model will land on the Elemsys leaderboard. You guys have any predictions if it'll be Command R+. I think exactly above or below Command R. I think this is... I would be... I would not, I would not resist if it will be much higher, but I think it will be somewhere within Command R. The base one, think? yeah? Uh, no, if, uh, when we stroll uh, find you need to and release the instruct version, I think it'll be somewhere over there because uh, they're yeah. really good at fine tuning instruct models as well. I guess the big question about this is it better than Mistral Large? Is this Mistral's new flagship best model? Uh, by the way, this I think that we already have the answer. At the moment, the results are on par with the Mistral Medium, uh, mm -hmm. but it's a base model. so. It might be somewhere, I mean, it might be, the results might be like Mr. Large, which will be interesting because Mr. Large is really, I don't know, a bomb, but I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, it's very interesting to predict the mixture instruct uh, position. Yeah, it's it's a bit surprising to me that the base model for mixture it might be better than command R. It is a very good base model, but for mixture large it reaches eighty one point in MMLU, but its performance in I'm says Chaba Arena is a bit a little bit different from our expectation. Yeah. I think uh, it might be a slightly worse than Mr. Large in Cheval Arena, personally, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, uh, it's about post-training techniques. It might be a very good base language models, but about post-training techniques, it might be somewhat a little bit different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, folks. So it looks like we've covered Mr. This is not the last time we're going to talk about or Big Stroll. This is not the last time we're going to talk about Big Stroll because, oh, it looks like we have Jiwoo. Awesome. I want to just uh, acknowledge Jiwoo Hong. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. So welcome. We finally made it. We were able to pull up some guests of ours on stage. This is an unexpected, but folks, Jiwoo, I'll just introduce this part just briefly. So folks, as you know, on Thursday, I one of the best things that I love when they happen is that when folks who actually are part of the releases, the breaking news, they actually come up to talk about this and breaking news the breaking news that we're talking about here is the first fine tune for big stroll for mistral 22 8 times 22 i don't even know how to pronounce this came out less than 48 hours after the model release and it's called zephyr and hagen face and Argia and kais the korean institute of science and technology jiwoo please correct me if i'm wrong released together using a technique called orpo and jiwoo here is one of the folks in charge of orpo and i want to welcome you feel, feel free to unmute and introduce yourself and let's talk about the fine tune and, and kind of the technique as well Yeah, first, thank you, LDJ, for inviting me to this awesome podcast. It's th the first time for me to join the podcast, so I had some technical problems joining it. But yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to get some questions and talk about these Zephyr Orpo projects and the model itself. Yeah. Awesome. So thank you for joining. You guys are from the Korean Institute of... Am I saying this right? Is this the, the right thing, Korean Institute of Science and Technology? Yeah, you can just call it Kaist AI. Kaist AI, awesome. So this is, yeah. and I, I've seen some folks of this institute come up to us in New IPS, and I've seen multiple folks around. So how are you guys related to this effort? And were you participating in the Zephyr effort as well? Yes, after uploading the Oracle paper, like we got the context from the Argila, which we 
which is the company that we use the data set from. And so the Argilla wanted to test the data scalability and the model scalability of Orpo. So if we think about the DPO or RLHF, they usually require like a, a lot of SFT before doing the alignment. So if it goes to the huge models like 141 billion, like Mixtro, then it is really like computationally expensive to do the SFT and the DPO. So what we were trying to do was like with the hugging face and Argilla, we can think of using a small amount of data set to make the aligned and chat model with the strong baseline PLM, which is the, the, the pre-trained language model. And I'm really happy that the scalability of our method and the data set is really promising and the results are pretty good. So yeah, I think the project is going really well. That's incredible. And uh, thanks for, for, for joining and talking about this. And it looks like we have Noah as well from the team. So Noah, feel free also to, to unmute and can introduce yourself briefly. And then I would love for you guys to explain Orpo to us just a little bit, because uh, at least for me, this is the first time that I'm talking about this. So I'm Noah Lee from Kleist as well. We're pretty new to the field as we're both master students, and we are really enjoying this um, field of AI and what we can actually contribute. So in general, Orpo is working really well. And in case you or the audiences have missed it, we do have very strong performing 7B models of Mistral and Llama-based Orpo models. So feel free to investigate those as well. Because one of the projects that we currently uh, just released is in examining how scalable this technique is. And as some, I might have missed the details, but some talk was going on, maybe it might not be performing as well in the chat arena, if I, I've been in and out, so I may have missed the, the details, but so we are looking to the issue and we're just um, seeing how this method itself is very scalable. And with only the 7K preference data set, we were able to uh, be very well performing in the IFAVAL and big bench hard. And, you know, the method itself, I think too can continue. And I, I definitely want to like, and you, if you can maybe expand on this, I want to talk about the ability to, to basically fine tune without the SFT. Could you explain this to folks who, who are not uh, from this area? Like, why is this method more performing and why? I think Omar from Hagen Face, it said it was trained in 1.3 hours in our cluster, but with lots of compute. Could you talk about that process a little bit more and why <laughs> this led to you guys basically being the first fine tuners of something this big that requires, as we previously talked about here, a lot of at least like on system RAM to load the whole model? Yeah, so let me start with the method, the Orpo method yes, itself yes. first. So the motivation kind of thing that we had is that, so DPO is like basically making the margin between the chosen responses and the rejected responses to be larger from the SFT policy. So after doing the SFT, the DPO authors say that the models are in the local minima. And so by performing the DPO on top of the SFT models, we can make a small margin between the chosen responses and rejected responses so that the models can be aligned to the chosen responses. So that is really huge motivation for our method. And so using, so in the Orpo, there is a two loss term. One is the NLL loss, which is used for fine tuning the language models in general. And there is a OR loss, which is, which comprises the odds ratio between the chosen responses and the rejected responses like they're the low, prob low probabilities of the chosen and the rejected responses. So we're following the, the basic idea of making the margin between the chosen and the rejected responses. But what we are thinking is in the preference data sets, if we use the DPO, then we are using the, the pairwise data sets to make the margin. But we thought that using the chosen responses inside the pairwise data set would be beneficial for the model to actually learn the knowledge and the type of the style inside the data set. So while doing the SFT on top of the pre-trained model, only on the chosen responses, we are giving the regularization term to the, the margin between the chosen and rejected responses. So this results in the model, which can learn many things from the chosen responses, but have a bit of more like low probabilities assigned to the chosen responses in comparison to the rejected responses. So that is the basic idea here. So the, and the, the fine tuning part, let's go to the fine tuning parts. And we use four 
clusters of eight hundreds, and we took 1.3 hours to fine tune the full fine tune the mixtral eight times 22 billion model. And we use the Capybara data, data set, which is the multi turn data set with the preference and which is really high quality and which is really good data set thanks to LDJ. Yeah, since we have the high quality data set and high quality per trained language model as a baseline, we think those two things like give really good impact on the final model after fine tuning with the Oracle. So within 1.3 hours, you can make really strong check models, not only the MOE models, but as Noah mentioned, we can fine tune the 7B models or 2B models too. That's incredible. And as Jan mentioned before, there's some folks who are trying to extract a one twenty two billion parameter, you know, expert out of this mixture of experts and going to be very interesting to see if this Opera technique can be applied to that one as well and see how well that performs. That's incredible. I just wanted to bring you guys here and to highlight the work because I haven't heard about Orpa before up until kind of Omar from Hugging Face highlighted that now the first fine tune happened like super quick because of it. And I wanted to bring you up here and tell the folks about your work and the impressive kind of results that it led to and that it scales to bigger models as well. Any comments from folks here on stage that want to want to ask you or Noah? Uh, Wing, do you know if, if there's support in Axolotl for this technique or should there be support or something? Sorry, I tell I tune out for a hot sec there. Uh, for which technique? The Orpo technique that the guys just used to fine tune. Oh the... yeah, it's intuitively supported in Axolotl already. Of course yeah. it so is. So we had gotten that I think first day, and then it also should work with Galore. So that's one of the things I'm trying now is see if I can get Orpo and Galore working with with the mixtral eight by twenty two. Yeah. Oh, so you're now you're looking into kind of combining several techniques together? Uh, Are you saying Galore? Is that the, the recent one? Yeah, right? the Galore. I think. Right now, it's just with the optimizer, it's a lot of uh, the RAM requirement with the optimizer. If we're able to drop Galore in, I think we can probably cut a lot of that out, and it should work with ORPO as well. Yeah, or ORPO. Yeah. Well, look forward to hearing more from you on this wing. And definitely, folks, give Wing a follow. And in, in Wing's mention, there are many folks who are doing the more incredible things here as well. LDJ, any last kind of questions for the folks from Kai's before we move on? Because we still have a bunch of stuff to talk about. Uh, one last little silly question, Abu and Noah. Uh, is it okay to, <laughs> would you say it's okay to pronounce it ORPO or ORPO or both are fine? Yeah, actually, I think both are fine. ORPO, ORPO, both can work. Naming is not silly, dude. We need naming. We're all getting stuck on saying mixtral 8 times 22. I think we can focus on Bigstrol, and then from now on, it's going to be Bigstrol, just because, at least for this audience, right? All right, folks, Noah and Jiwoo, thank you so much. Feel free to stay, stick around, because we're talking about a bunch of open source. Maybe you have some comments. We also need to talk about the Gemma stuff, and Yam, I would love to chat with you about specifically recurrent Gemma, because I have no idea what that was, and I, I think I missed it. But folks from Google gave us, I think, a day before the kind of the big announcements. Google, if you guys remember, Google gave us the first open weights model called Gemma, uh, a few weeks ago, it was very surprising from Google to step up, uh, maybe or even a month ago, Gemma, and it was very surprising for them to step up. And now they said, hey, we're going to actually like, we've updated the Gemma stuff to 1.1 and they released instruct 2 billion parameters and 7 billion parameters and they addressed some feedback from the community which which was uh, very interesting to see from them they updated instruction following and factuality and coding and reasoning i actually haven't been able to play with this because again this week was crazy but it's great to see them release updates to gemma as well they said they mitigated the overuse of sure comma at the start of every model answer which is a result of something like a fine tune that, that can happen with specific with specific data. What else in Gemma before kind of the other stuff? So this was like on a, oh yeah. And also they put quotes around the 7B. And Justin, if you remember, we talked about how it's not really a 7B model. When they released Gemma, it was more close to like 8.5 or something. So now the guy behind Gemma, Robert Dashi, I think from Google DeepMind, he's like, we announced Gemma Instruct 2B and quotes 7B, which is really funny. Did you did you see their update on Gemma stuff, Justin? Do you have a chance to look at it? Yeah, I just saw its uh, update. I didn't use it. Uh, it's an instruction uh, improved. Uh, I think its uh, instruction model is uh, improved a lot mm -hmm. uh, because previously people think that uh, the, the model is not that good. Uh, it's not consistent with the 
base model quality, but this is somehow uh, it is a good model. I think it's a top level CMV model at least. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's not the only thing they released with Gemma. They also updated a few models for code Gemma. So they released fine tunes. If you guys remember Llama and then Code Llama released and gave us like fine tunes for code generation specifically. Code Gemma was released from the the Gemma team or at Google. I don't know if they have a different team there. Google DeepMind. 2 billion parameter for code generation and filling, and then also 7B params for code gen as well, and also 7B for instruct following. And then also, at the same breath, they released something called Recurrent Gemma, which, uh, Yam, I know you, you talked about. I would love to hear from you what's different about this model. Yeah, Google released last week, I think, a paper highlighting their own non non exactly transformer architecture recurrent neural network rwkv and other models of the deep side the thing is that they are much more efficient in terms of the context length which makes sense they don't do attention over everything uh, but the question about them is uh, whether or not they are good at scale we already know that they are pretty good uh, on smaller scales but training them on larger scales is is, is a risk um, so people were surprised that uh, google has uh, such a uh, such an in-depth research and results for such model. And we're curious to know whether or not they, uh, they have other models that are very efficient for large context, if you get what I mean, because uh, they happen to have a service that is very efficient at large context. So people were curious whether or not these two have any connections. Anyway, this week we got a model. Uh, we got a 2B model. It's called Recurrent Gemma. It follows some of the insights from the paper. It's just to be a to be model, but it's really good. And, uh, and you should try it. And it just makes people even more curious now, whether or not it has any connection to other services that <laughs> is very efficient for large contexts. Just ahead, to please. give everyone a summary about everything. We have four releases from Google. We have Gemma Instruct, a better one. We have Recurrent Gemma. We have Code Gemma, and I think, just to make sure, yeah, I th actually three. Yeah, so we have three. Three, three in the open issue. weights area, at least, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So, so recurrent Gemma is very interesting and very interesting to see whether or not this is, let, let's mm -hmm. Google to run at scale different things. And you said this is the RNN stuff and very similar to RWKV as well. Is that what I'm hearing from you? Is the, State, space models, different things. Are those in the same area? State, yeah, state space and, and RWKV are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. RWKV is more like uh, an RNN. It's not exactly vanilla RNN, but it's more like an RNN. It's not transformer for sure. Recurrent Gemma is a little bit different. It uses uh, a local attention. As, as I'm not sure it's been used in uh, RWKV. It's a, it's a different trick mm -hmm. over there. But yeah, it's the same. They are both RNN-wise. So they're both non vanilla transformers. State space are a little bit different. They are more like convolution, a 1D convolution inspired by 1D convolution with non-local filters, but they are a little bit different. But anyway, the whole idea is let's find some sort of a model that is as close as possible in terms of performance, but it not, doesn't cost the same compute uh, memory VRAM in, in terms of when you actually run it because transformers just multiply everything by everything and becomes quadratic. And yeah, so the reducing this just makes everything cheaper, everything, because everything is expensive now. <laughs> a reduced memory usage is what they highlight. And I think that's what we saw from Jamba as well on longer mm -hmm. sequences, longer context and higher throughput. We, we talked and folks, if you're interested in Jamba, which is a kind of hybrid architecture, we had a chat with the folks from AI21. More than welcome to tune to more for more information to tune into that episode. And definitely the it looks like the benefits are similar to something like this to occur in Jamba as well. Look, on higher sequences, lower and reduced memory usages. Which, if you're Google, and we're going to talk about the like general availability of their one million uh, context window uh, models, you definitely are looking towards that reduced memory uh, to be able to to allow this context window to everybody else. So yeah, we covered Code Gemma. Anything else, LDJ, maybe from you or Justin, any comments on the Gemma updates? Very interesting that they keep giving us more stuff, which is very impressive. And shout out to the team at Google that works on Gemma and keeps updating. Yeah, I think Code Gemma is something I recently focused on because we are now building some code specific LLMs. But I think that the Code Gemma 
billion parameter is not state of the art in the 70, 7 billion uh, code specific model. For code specific model, it seems that deep sea coder is still the best uh, mm -hmm. in the benchmark evaluation. So uh, I think that it is a good model. It, it is worth a try, but uh, it is somehow uh, not as uh, surprising to me. Yep. Yeah, and the small one, the 2B one, looks interesting, but remains to be seen on different comparisons as well. So I think the last thing that we haven't covered in the open source before we move on is AutoCode Rover. So again, if just a brief reminder for folks, this is more from like the prompt engineering maybe area, and we do have tons to talk about in kind of the second hour as we're coming up on this. If you guys remember, we briefly covered Devin and Devin was on everybody's like X or, or at least got a lot of hype from a lot of investments on, on, on Twitter on X. Devin was this agent basically that had access to a browser, a code environment. I think it had their own uh, their own Docker container or something for each run of Devin. And it's still very interesting. We saw Swix, friend of the pod and kind of the co-host of Latent Space, got access to Devin and, and tries to, I think, build... Let me see if, if uh, Junaid in the audience, let's talk about Devin a little bit afterwards. But try to ask the community to say, hey, give me some stuff for Devin to build. And Devin is slow. But I think the highlight for Devin was its score on something called... So Ebench is this metric that the, the folks from... Um, I don't remember where, where Fear Press is from, but they released like a metric for basically a software engineer tasks, uh, the long running tasks. And Devin got 13%, which was like the highlight of this back then on this SWE, SWE Bench data set. And then a week afterwards, we saw the same folks who came up with SWE Bench. They released their own thing called SWE Agent, which not only looked at Devin, uh, so, so it's less of a polished product. Devin is a product you can sign up. If you get access, you actually have the, the model um, get access to a browser, get access to, to a code, to an ID, etc. Um, the folks who came up with Sweet Agent last week came up with, sorry, with the Sweet Benchmark, came up with Sweet Agent and said that it, they achieved 17% on this very hard task. Just for comparison, the basic GPT-4 with some rag got 1.4% or 5% on the same task, right? So just for, for your comparison of how, how hard they designed this task to be. So basic vanilla, I think Claude Opus got 4% or something. So a very hard task for like basic LLMs to just autocomplete. It needs more prompting. And now we got AutoCode Rover to get to 22% on Sweet Bench. Not only that, they significantly lowered the cost from the, the, the previous 17%. We had a new agent, basically to sum it up, we got a new agent called ASR, ACR, AutoCode Rover, that now beats the previous state-of-the-art kind of bench scorer, which is a three agent, which reads Devin, which Devin received like a lot of praise as well. Just to make this a long story short, we're seeing incredible jumps in the ability of these models to perform well on this very hard task where it requires you know access to code and, and and different techniques and i just wanted to highlight like how how fast this is moving and also the kind of stuff that it's now able to do so maybe a, a brief chat with junaid junaid is a is a friend of mine has been in uh, thursday for, for a long time and we also co-host the denver ai meetup together so if you're in denver boulder please sign up and follow junaid for that for those updates junaid you and swix had a conversation about devon i would love to briefly cover this what you guys were able to do with it yeah, so basically last year, the second app that I made was a really simple um, Sprite Kit iOS game, frog themed, of course. And, of course. you know, I built it, you know, with ChatGPT, MidJourney, and, you know, Traxy, the uh, music generator. And I, I made the, the repository open in case anybody wanted to hack on it or play with it or whatever. And so I saw Swix posted that he had Devin and, you know, you know, give me your, give me your repos. What, what can we do? And so I just gave him my, the link to my repo and said, here you go. It could use some improvement of the scoring and collision detection. Like it, you know, if it, if the frog intersects a bug, it's supposed to eat the bug and increment the score, however many points the bug's worth. But sometimes it was like, not really working correctly. And then also I wanted to add haptic feedback so that anytime, you know, the frog ate a bug, it would give a little shake to the phone. So I just told him that and he threw that at Devin and, you know, it took a couple of back and forths with it. And then it opened a PR. I went ahead and took a look at it. It looked like it might work. So Devin did, right? In. Not Swix. Devin opened the pull request. Not Swix, Devin. To your repo. Yeah, Devin said, yeah, 
that Swix said to Devin, go ahead and, you know, open a PR. You can use my login. And I think he forked it and opened a PR. And then I went ahead and checked that out, pulled it to my machine. It didn't quite do a good job on the, it broke the collision detection a little bit, but it did exactly what it was supposed to for the haptics. I reverted the change for the collision detection and tested out the haptics a bit and pushed it to test flight. It worked. So I went ahead and submitted it to App Store. And I think they took all of 20 minutes to approve it after they actually, you know, opened the file or whatever. So I just want to like recap this like uh, super quick for folks. I'm talking about a new release called Autocode Rover. It's in the open source and you can try it right now and it gets 22% on the task of Sweebench. Sweebench is basically what Junaid just described. That's the task as, uh, as they're designed to do. It's like an agent-based task to be able to go and actually uh, ch check out a repository, etc., or like actually do fixes into a repository uh, with multiple, you know, different files of code. It's not just code completion, like code Gemma that we just talked about or, or recurrent Gemma. It's not just, hey, take this code and infill some stuff. It's actually the ability to understand code bases and, and participate in the process of improving them, which we saw from Devin. And so what uh, Junaid just described is Devin, the, the very well invested in and very hyped product, very high quality product as well. Junaid, you don't have access, like, but Swix did. And Swix uh, no, just... No, unfortunately not. So if Devin, wants Devin, folks, access. yes, please, yes, please. We're gonna we're gonna request access for the you know Thursday I crew. But basically, Swig just asked for task. Junaid came up with a task and a link to a GitHub repo, and then Devin continued to do the work to understand. I'm pretty sure that Devin did not run this in a simulator because I don't think that environment has access to be able to compile you know Swift UI etc. However, it still committed some code and did some improvements. And this code now landed in, in App Store, which is incredible. So thanks, Junaid, for covering this. Devin gets 13% on basically the same task. Since then, we got in, and Devin was like well invested and the team is super cracked, etc. Since then, we saw two huge jumps in that abilities, or at least in the benchmark that measures this ability. From Devin's 13% to SV agents, 17%, and now into 22% category, which is quite incredible. I just want to highlight how fast we're moving into the disabilities of things doing these very complex tasks that require multiple turns, etc. And I think Devin, the highlight of Devin is like it takes a long time because there's a lot of prompt engineering going on as well. It was very important to us to cover. Anything else that we haven't uh, talked about that was worth mentioning at least? Yeah, I think that uh, there are more technical stuff like uh, Unslot now allows for training extremely long contacts. Unslot, the package that allows you to train much faster. On Huggyface, Sophia, the optimizer from last year that is back on headlines because uh, some heavy experimentation were conducted and it seems to be outperforming Adam W if you have the right type of parameters. I'm not yet uh, sure how to get these type of parameters. It's yeah, the last time I tried, let's uh, talk about I, I this couldn't for a get second. them, but uh, yeah. Let's talk about right, Sophia, sure. because Adam W Optimizer, I think if I'm trying to like remember every technical detail that I remember about this is a very old kind of technique that's still used pretty much everywhere. And Perfect. this is yeah. one just of those. To, just to give everyone a yes, perspective, please. Adam, I, I think that Adam is the most cited paper in the world on, on I think, if I, if I remember correctly, the Adam, the original one. Yeah, it's pretty much everywhere. And then it's, it's, multiple uh, folks yeah. try to replace it. And it's like the LK99 of this world where like, <laughs> if Adam W is going to get ever replaced or not, like every time there's, hey, we beat Adam W and this benchmark ends up not being like true, or at least we haven't seen like a, a replacement. And so Sophia looks very interesting in that. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, look, Sophia, okay. M most people that try to beat Adam W, often just revolves around more tricks on top gradient descent. Adam W, Adam is adaptive momentum, that's the name, that's the trick. Adam W, eight, eight, weight decay, that's the W. But everyone, and it's on top of gradient descent, yeah. But the thing is, unless you just do an insane amount of experiments on many different benchmarks and setups and models and different architecture, it's very hard to even validate. So the only one that might be, and still a debate, and might be beating Adam W is Lion from Google. And they, on their paper, they did go through the, it, it said the amount of compute they use for the experiments is amazing. But Sophia is using a second order optimization, which is something that uh, many other different optimizers don't do. So it might be 
a special, it might provide a special value to the optimization. In theory, there should be something. Yeah. But the thing is that at least when I tried it, I couldn't get the hyperparameters that will actually outperform Adam. But again, it might be just me very used to Adam and trying hyperparameters that I know work well with Adam. And it might be true, but again, it's, it requires a little bit of experience. I have a lot of experience with Adam because of all of these years. And I don't have any experience with Sophia, so I might just, it might be me and not the optimizer. And just there, there are hints that we might want to look, look into this because better optimizer is better all, everything. Like every, every single training, whatever, gets better if we have better optimizer. And we know how to tune it. So, yeah. So it's interesting. We need a better more optimizer and hopefully we'll get it. Folks who want to follow, it looks like Armin Agajanyan, I think is the last name. Uh, I just pinned it to the top of the space. He's doing the very impressive work of following up and follow him for more info. And I think he's been popping up on the timeline and Yam as well is participating in at least some of the conversation. Don't, don't you just love Twitter? Don't things that are Things like this are just happening and you're like, yeah, yeah, let's participate. I personally love it. All right, folks, we've been at this for almost an hour and a half. Let me reset the space as we're moving on to the next big thing that we want to talk about, which is like big companies and APIs. And there's tons to talk about there as well. So resetting the space and we're going to be we're going to be talking about some super cool and very interesting things. All right, you are on the the second hour of Thursday I. Those of you who just joined us, welcome. You're on Thursday I, where we talk about everything important and high signal that happened in the world of AI this week. And so far, we covered the open source. There's been a lot, but we got a chance to host the folks, the first folks who fine tuned Bixtrol. So we talked about the release of Mixtrol A22, and we also got two folks from the KAIST AI, Korea Institute of Science and Technology, folks who came up with this new technique called Orpo, and to talk about the technique itself, but also the first fine tuned called Zephyr from Hagen Face, KAIST, and Argia. It's the first Bixtrol, so it's been less than 24 hours, I want to say, and they already fine tuned this, this beast. But now we're moving on to our second biggest conversation. There's a bunch to, to talk about there as well from the big companies and APIs. And just before this, I want to like highlight a few things. My name is Alex Volkov. I'm the AI evangelist with weights and biases. Weights and biases is the system of record for many folks who train these models. And specifically, I think Armin, the, the one that we just mentioned from the Sophia test, also uses weights and biases to, to do the testing. And we, in the corner of this week's buzz, where I cover everything that happens in, in weights and biases, I just want to say that if you are in San Francisco next week and you want to join us, our annual conference called Fully Connected is next week, exactly on Thursday. Also from that, probably there's not going to be any show next week. I'm probably going to pre-record or something, unless the folks in the community want to pick this up. LDJ, Yam, if you want to do a Thursday I without me, that's going to be awesome. But we're probably going to at least send a newsletter as well. And next week, we have some codes for you. If you want to join us, if you're in San Francisco, or you really want to go to San Francisco and you're looking for an excuse for your boss, you're more than welcome to join us in San Francisco, April 18th. And April 17th is a workshop that we're running to talk about how to actually use AI in your business. So if you sign up and you use the code THURSDAI in there, you're, get, you're going to get a discount to come to the conference. I would love to see all of you there and high five me and say, hey, we're here because of Thursday I. And I know definitely some folks already from the audience is joining us as well in that. The additional thing in Wits and Biases is that last week we also had an announcement of our own and we released something called Weave, which is a toolkit for LLM ops. So far, what you know from Wits and Biases was Weights and Biases is the ML ops or at least observability tooling and a system of record. Now, Weights and Biases is basically two different things. It's the models, which is the product that you all use and love and everybody loves in the world. But also now we have something called Weave, which if you do any type of prompting at all, if you do any type of usage with LLMs, the next part of what we're going to talk about is also API LLMs. If you use any APIs at all, you want to track them. Now you have the Weights and Biases for that. It's called Weave. It's very exciting. I'm probably going to keep more, keep talking about this more. If you want to hear the announcement itself, last week I talked with Scott and and team from the, the team that built Weave. And it, it's been a very exciting week for us at Weights and Biases because people are discovering this tool and it's super cool to track all your prompts. So I'm going to be talking about this more at the workshop as well. If you want to join us, feel free to use the code THURSDAI at fullyconnected.com. 
Now we're moving on towards the big company LLM area, which was also very hot this week because we had multiple things happen all at once in the same day. If you guys remember, we first started covering Mistral, Mistral the company, in the open source segment because they released open source stuff. Then they introduced something called LeChat, which is their like API platform, etc. Or La, La Platform, I think it's called. And so we started covering M <laughs> Mistral based on what the type of news they have. If they have open source news, we're covering them in the open source segment. If they have API news, we cover them in the big companies segment. So today we also have the same with Google. Google announced not only that the Gemma updates are released, Google's thing that Jan mentioned before, which is a Gemina 1.5 Pro, is the only model that we have access to, we, the plebs, let's say, that has 1 million tokens in the context window, the ability to actually use up to 1 million tokens in the context window, which is insane. The closest one to that, I think, right now is still Claude with 200k, I think. And 1 million is just insane. It's able to understand one hour of video. You can upload like a video up to eight hours of audio. So they released a few updates for Gemini 1.5 Pro, which we definitely want to cover. So first of all, it's free. They released pricing and up to a certain amount, everybody can use it for free, which is honestly just Google can do it, right? We talked about GPT 3.5 was free for a long time. Obviously free is in quotes because they collected data, but now 1.5 Pro with the 1 million contacts is free to use, which is quite incredible. Also, they released an update where it's available in 180 countries, apparently, including some very unique and small ones. And I think the biggest update capability wise is it understands audio natively now. Would love to chat about this as well with you folks. It understands audio and it's not only transcribing like it would you whisper. It, they, they actually built like an audio encoder, I think, in there, which is incredible. And only also something that only Google can do. You can upload files. So they revamped their API to be able to upload files. And they casually mentioned this somewhere. We allow to file uploads up to two gigabytes. <laughs> which is insane if you think about this at the scale of Google and the, the amount of people who use the Gemini tooling and the ability to run this model in 1 million context window, but also allow up to 2 gigabytes individual uploads, which then get deleted. They don't store it for you, but you're able to send up to 2 gigabyte video file, for example, or audio file, or unlimited amount of files. So you are able to prompt this model with, I don't know, six books, plus a video file, plus an audio file, plus your prompts, and you'll be able to like shove all of this into the context, which is, is quite crazy. And I think they also mentioned that JSON mode as well, which was a very helpful thing. Quite a re impressive release from Gemini 1.5. And I think that's most of the stuff that I wanted to cover. And I wanted to hear folks here on stage. If you, yeah, I know we briefly mentioned Gemini before in the context thing. Uh, have you seen these updates? What's your reaction? Have you been able to play with it? And did they open up in Israel finally? Uh, I haven't, I haven't heard it yet, uh, but uh, from what I heard, uh, it's, it's a, it, it's a substantial update. Yep. It's, it's a major update, should be. But uh, no, I haven't, I haven't tried it yet. Um, looking forward. Anybody else here? I definitely play with it. I haven't played since the update, but I, I really. Oh no, I actually did. I uploaded the recording for a previous show. A full recording with no context. I just said, hey, what are some of the interesting parts in this recording? And it extracted the, it, it transcribed and extracted within 50 seconds. It gave me the exact timestamps of everything that was important to talk about. Plus also the kind of the summary of those parts. And it took 50 seconds. What, what I usually do, just to give you a comparison, guys, what I usually do is I transcribe the whole so the whole show and then i assign uh, individual speaking labels right so i go through it and i say okay this is yam this is ldj this is alex this is uh, you know justin and then i send the, the text the transcript transcribed text into cloud or something so that's my usual process here i skipped all of this i was able to take the mp3 file just drag and drop it into gemini 1.5 pro and it took 40 seconds and it basically did the same thing uh on its own which is quite impressive blew, blew me away like i gotta say because it you know not only it saves me time it was able to do it without a lot of prompting and without a lot of examples and i also hear from many folks that you know gemini now is, is also significantly updated in its ability to to respond and and, and get steered based on your commands uh because they also improved that so very impressive anybody else want to chat about this because i have a few more things and then we're going to move over oh yeah one last thing that they added is uh, a new embedding model as well, which <laughs> very funnily they called text embedding 004, which is funny, 
And the, the reason it's funny is because the the new embedding models, the quote unquote new embedding models from OpenAI, they call text embedding three. And now Google uh, Gemini released something called text embedding four, which is I think even competitive on the embedding MTB benchmark uh, score, which I, I, I need to go and check for you guys. But uh, they also released like a new embedding, and it's really funny. They first they got uh, Logan Kilpatrick to announce their updates. And not the OpenAI updates. It's weird still, but we're gonna get used to it. And also now they're releasing like embedding models that kind of continue the same naming or the same uh, numbering from from OpenAI as well. In addition to that, they released JSON mode, which is great because you get JSON objects back. And they have an API, significant improvements in the Gemini API with system instructions as well, which we all know the system instructions are needed. So, any comments from folks here about Gemini? And if not, we're gonna move. To the next topic just a quick spot check no doesn't look like anybody wants to talk about this on the folks on stage and the same day that we got mixtral that we got new gemma models we got new gemini models OpenAI also said hey you know what we have a new thing it's called new gpt4 and it's majorly improved and that's it that's all they said and then everybody, you know, every release, yeah, I'll give you, get to it in just a second. Every release from OpenAI usually gets posted from their main account. And then everybody from OpenAI, Greg Bachman, whatever, everybody reposts and reposts. And this is the same thing happened here. Basically, they didn't say anything that was new besides the numbering. It's now GPT-4 Turbo 2024 0409. So, you know, April 9th, 2024. It was released, what, two days ago. And yeah, Yam, any comments before we like, delve into this model? Oh, let's delve in. Yeah, just wanted to joke around that GPT-4 Turbo is majorly improved. Yeah, it is majorly that, improved. That's it. And, and end of text token. End, end of, of text, text token. token. Yeah. <laughs> so let's delve into this. So the first, the technical thing that they actually announced is that it combines the vision stuff with the functions in, in one API. So previously... Something like Claude was multimodal. You'd, you'd be able to prompt Claude with images and text tokens as well and, and do functions as well. So you'd be able to get like uh, Claude recently announced function calling or slash tool use to do on the same API as the vision stuff. GPT-4 had a different preview for vision stuff. You, you, you were able to get to GPT-4 Turbo, send it images, but you weren't able to combine the kind of the tool use. So they now unified it into one. And also it looks like they finally uh, put it in kind of general availability, not a preview. So the vision stuff, since there is the vision, was in like preview mode, and now they, they put it in like a specific API point. They also mentioned some of the folks who built on top of this vision API that they now released for all of us. Again, we had access to the preview, but uh, now they, we actually have access to the, the full model. And funnily enough, Devin, the, the kind of the AI agent that we covered before, Devin was one of the companies they highlighted in this release that use this vision API to achieve like very impressive things as well. But also, these are just the technical stuff. They also claim that it's much better at math, etc. And then many people started like showing that it's actually way better than, than previous GPT-4 models. And I just want to say that we started the show with saying, hey, this week for the first time, some like a command R beat a GPT-4 model on the actual arena rankings, like the LMC arena. And we need to specify which GPT-4. So, yeah, I think you mentioned this. Dev, sorry, uh, Command R beats GPT-4 from last year's March and GPT-4 from la last year's June. Since then, we had like maybe four or five releases. GPT-4 Turbo came and then Turbo had a few more versions as well. This version is GPT-4 Turbo 2024-0409. Nothing beats that yet. We haven't seen it. This, may, th th this model may beat Cloud Opus and reclaim its throne, reclaim its place as, the, as the, the best model we can have access to. At least on some rankings that I saw, it already beats Cloud Opus, which Opus is an incredible model on, on a few rankings. So we haven't seen, because again, OpenAI, <laughs> OpenAI is not even open in kind of the rankings as well. So we don't get, we, we don't get rankings there, but from multiple folks, including Matt, who was here b before and like, one of the goats of, of prompting that I know, we haven't seen, we have multiple people that are confirming that this model is like significantly better and it is quote unquote majorly improved, OpenAI said. One of those is Cursor. So the editor that's AI infused and if you're not using Cursor, you definitely should. Cursor actually released like a side-by-side -side comparison that shows that this model is like less verbose and more like to the point as well. Let me see if I can... Find another example. Yeah, one of the folks from Live Code Bench 
they show a huge reasoning, a huge jump in math and reasoning for their coding benchmark for this model. Something like uh, Claude gets, I should pin this as well. Claude gets, Claude Opus gets 58% on their benchmark and this new GPT-4 Turbo gets 66, which is incredible. So like the, the, the previous distance between Claude and GPT-4 is like 55 to 58, like the two or 3%. And this jumps by almost like eight or like nine basis points, which is, significant improvement if you think about how well these models improve. So I, I've seen quite a few examples of this model being way better. It's not yet on the chatbot as well, right? So you, you can't like just talk to it, I think. I think you need to I think you need to use it on the API only. But OpenAI is not playing. It's really funny that they're not saying anything, but they're not playing. It looks like we got like the new king of of uh, of logic here. So I've been at least in the cursor kind of area, I switched to it and wanted to try it out. But again, like I'm saying, everything happened that we covered, everything major here happened yesterday all together. So folks like us have to like, first of all, keep you up to date to remember everything that happened and then try to use at least a little bit of using this. So folks, I think that this covers it. We, we got basically a new GPT-4 Turbo in addition to new Gemini, in addition to new Mixtral. And on top of that, I think we finally got confirmation that Llama is coming soon. So uh, DJ, we wanted to cover this last time, but we didn't have a confirmation. We saw the leak from the information and then multiple people reposted the same leak. But now we actually had a confirmation, folks, that Llama is coming in probably less than a week. I want to see, yeah, oh, yeah. DJ, you want to talk about this? I'm going to go and find the tweet. Sure, yeah, I do. I remember I sent a message to you with an exact quote, so I'll, I'm just going to read off that right now mm -hmm. in front of me. Nick Clegg, Meta's president of global affairs. Here's a direct quote from him. He said, quote, within the next month, actually less, hopefully in a very short period of time, we hope to start rolling out our new suite of next generation foundation models, Llama 3, end quote. He said that apparently just a day or two ago. Yeah, that pretty much confirms at the most, at the latest, it would come out like 30 days from now or something. I'm very excited about this. I'm like, obviously... This whole open source field with AI didn't start with Llama, but Llama made a significant improvement in all of this. And Llama 2 also came out like swinging. And now they're looking at this field being overtaken by the folks like Mistral, which if you guys don't know, two out of the three co-founders, I think, worked on the original Llama. I think Guillaume, the chief scientist of Mistral, and Arthur both were the co-authors of the first Llama. And now, LDJ didn't know this or is just reacting for fun? No, I didn't know that, but it's something actually, it's another part of the quote that I forgot to read that is surprising if you want me to read it. Oh, yes, please. Okay, so he also said, quote, there will be a number of different models with the different capabilities, different versatilities released during the course of this year, starting really very soon. So maybe, I don't know, that could mean a lot of things, but maybe something like new image segmentation models or new audio models or something, but they're saying released, which... We know they've done a lot of cool research around things like some audio models, but haven't actually released them open source and things like that. But yeah, like the fact they're saying releasing multiple different kinds of models, that, that's exciting. Maybe something Jeppa related to. I'm super excited specifically about the combination of the multimodality stuff that has been outsourcing, open sourcing a lot of multimodality stuff, a lot of models that do like multiple things together. Justin, go ahead. Yeah, I, I can confirm this, uh, I just heard that they are uh, adding image and video to the Llama 3 model. So I think the model will be totally multi-model. But I, I don't know if last month, next month we are having a model of multi-model or just a length model, but I'm sure there will be something that is connecting image and video. Yeah. Yeah, according to the original information leak, which was like a week or so ago, they said that only the larger versions will be multimodal and only the smaller versions will be released over the next week or so. And then it'll, it will be like at least another month or so before they release the larger versions that are actually multimodal. But I'm hoping that's not true. And I'm hoping all of the sizes, including the smaller ones also have multimodality because I'm not sure why they wouldn't release the smaller ones with multimodal too. I will say this one thing that I really want to add to, to the whole thing where the models that beat GPT-4, they're all text models. 
DBRX and Coheres Command R and uh, now Mixtral that we're hoping that's going to be GPT-4 on, on, on rankings, all of them are text-based models that input text and output text only, right? And we know from the start that like one of the cool things about GPT-4, it also had like a vision as well. And it does look like most of the other bigger labs, like Op Opus is multimodal and, you know, Gemini is obviously super multimodal up to images and video and audio now. So the, the competition for open source is very incredible to see that you're now able to run GPT-4 or at least like last year's GPT-4 level models locally and fine tune them. Still, though, we're not competing on the multimodality, which is the next jump as well. And it's going to be very interesting because Meta did a lot of improvements in this area on their own. And I'm very excited to see like a GPT-4 competing model, hopefully that this is what Llama 3 will be. Uh, as, as you guys remember, Zuck announced that they will have something like a 640,000 H100 compute equivalent hours or like abilities by the end of this year. So they're going to put some of this in use and it looks like Llama 3 is going to be quite insane. The one last thing I want to talk about in the big company APIs kind of updates is, so Llama is coming out soon. Very excited about that. We'll see how well it performs. Hopefully it's multimodal, but we don't, besides the fact that we have a confirmation, there's not that much to say about this. And Jun Yang, thanks for confirming that it's probably going to be multimodal, LDG as well. One last thing I wanted to cover here is some updates from Elon Musk about Grok. First of all, Grok now powers, I don't know if you guys saw, at least on desktop, if you look to the right, you see the news and you see a little bit of a, of a title as well. And then if you click into this, you'll see like a description. And under this, you'll see Grok is in early feature, blah, blah, blah. So they started using Grok to, I'm sorry for the pun, to Grok the news. They started to use Grok to actually summarize what happens. And I got to say, that for me, this works very well. I'm just going to read out to you my top of Explore. Obviously, you guys know that I collect all this info and LDJ and Yama, like all of us and Justin, we all collect this info from the, our X feeds as well. But I got to say that for me, it's really fine to, to the stuff that I want to read about. So my top Explore stuff about technologies now is Mixtral 8 times 22 b which we covered, Hume AI pin, because they started shipping the AI pin, which we didn't cover. Yes, they, they ship the AI pin. So like uh, the discussion about the AI pin. Then we have the Snowflake Copilot and we have AI hits in music debate, which we will cover soon. So the stuff that I get in my Explorer that is now curated by Grok is actually the stuff that I want to talk about, which is quite impressive. And when you click on it, it actually shows a very decent summary of the news, which is we all want AI to be very helpful. And to me, Grok is helpful, which I can't believe I'm saying. We covered that Grok was open source, which is impressive. And we quickly forgot about this because it was beaten by many other open source uh, models of bigger sizes. But Elon Musk did say that they finished or about to finish uh, Grok 2 uh, training in May and maybe even come in May. So we may see like a head-to-head -head Grok 2 versus Llama, uh, which is going to be very interesting. And uh, he also mentioned that Grok 3 will require 100,000 H100s. That's what that's the quote from Elon. At some point, you, you never know. Like with Elon, the, his estimations are off off base often, and also are new to the team. So the team at Grok may not have known that they're about to release Grok two very soon. Like they may have not have known that they are about to fi open source Grok back then. But we'll see, and we're definitely going to keep you posted about Grok. But I'm just excited that we, we get another use case of of something like Grok. We get another use case and actually be able to use it. And if you haven't used the Grok itself, the UI, I think it's now possible to everybody who's premium. It's a decent way of actually searching for stuff that you saw on your feed and you didn't remember. And there was like a feud between Superbase and Cal.com, whatever, on my feed. I didn't really get what it was about. I just went to Grok and I asked about this. It was able to pull the relevant tweets and actually give me a decent summary of what actually happened, which is a very useful thing for me. Shout out to like the folks at XAI that are working on Grok. So we're transitioning to AI audio, AI music. having the ChatGPT moment for AI music because for most of the week since last week we got hints and leaks from this new 
music service called Udio, which didn't even know what there was, this, this was Udio. Apparently, my name was used in one of these leaks, which was very funny because like people started tagging me in all different things. I didn't have access. I didn't have early access to Udio or anything, but a friend of mine created a song and then it was leaked that actually said like Alex Volkov and mentioned me and with Vision Pro or something. I don't know if you heard this, but I was getting tagged and multiple people getting very excited about the new style of or the new product in the AI music space. So the new one is called Udio, and it's based on a few folks that is very heavily invested in as well. A16Z invested in this. I saw Will I Am post about this on his like timeline. That, like AI music now changed forever, and it it sounds, folks, it sounds very decent. I really want to play you a snippet, and hopefully I'm able to. I think I did. Yeah, let's do this one. The greatest leader we've ever seen. They say that he's the listen Al Gaheen. Eyes bright blue and hair jet black. You should see him ride on a sandworm's back. Lead us to victory, you so blue a team. Oh, we love you, Paul The man who's going to set the firm and free. Folks, this is a Dune in the Broadway musical Showtunes soundtrack. And it sounds, I don't know, to me it sounds incredible. Just a question, the yes, lyrics please. is by yourself or also by the, the model? Because it's impressive, the lyrics on their own. Absolutely. The model does... All of it. So I actually don't know if the model does it like on a on a model basis or if they, you know, if they have like a GPT-4 or something fine tuned. But definitely you're able to just ask for what you want and get a and get the one second. Let me just add yeah, LDJ back. So, yeah, you're able to ask for what you want. Like you're able to say, hey, give me like the Dune, the Broadway musical. And they're doing some very incredible stuff. Unlike Suno, the, the other uh, AI to music one that's been popping up, Udio have something that's called AI Enhanced Prompts. And if you guys remember something like Ideogram for diffusion models and different things, they know that folks don't necessarily know all the genres. So they enhance prompts with their like own AI. But also, yeah, Yam, to your question specifically, these services, they write lyrics for you as well. You're able to just ask for something like, a, hey, I want something like a uh, Broadway musical for Dune. And they would generate the music, the lyrics, and suggest the styles for you as well. I actually don't know in this one if the lyrics were written by it, but the lyrics here are really impressive as well. So... What's new about Udio? Besides the fact that it's a different model, it sounds a little fuller than Suno. Uh, it sounds like uh, one other example if, if from, I think, um, a classical music. Let me actually go and find this. This needs to be a, how should I say? Th this section of Thursday needs to be multimodal. I need to play you some stuff for you to like actually appreciate, which I think is a, a very cool things about these like AI to music models as well, that you're able to, you're able to experience them, to play around, to create some music create is a big word here but like to get some music out of them one one example that i wanted to highlight yes this one is very impressive folks at Udio, so you can hear multiple musical instruments in this. You can hear, it's just, it, it's full and it sounds incredible. At least to me, like to my ears, it sounds incredible. I tried to prompt Suno with the same exact kind of prompt that I got from this. The the, the guy who prompted this, it's f very funny. The guy reacted and said, I posted this on their main track and the, they didn't say we created this. They said well, one of the users created this and the guy said, I prompted it. He didn't say I created it, obviously, because the act of creation now is very <laughs> blurry, right? What's creation? But he said, I, I prompted it. And one highlight of, of this is that he said the original prompt was very different to what it looks like been changed to. Uh, he, he used something like classical Baroque Bach Vivaldi concerto for two harp. She chords, I don't even know how to say harp she chords, uh, in D minor. So the person who prompted it actually knew what they were working on, but then their model actually augmented this audio, which is quite incredible. And I don't know, guys, I just listened to this. 
I never heard anything come out of AI that sounds this good with these multiple things. I used the same prompt that he gave me in Suno. Suno didn't come nearly close. You could hear that, that it sounds like less less interesting in Suno. And this just this is just incredible to me. So it does look like AI is having its music moment. This is like a very well-backed company. Audio is free to use right now, so they definitely want to collect as many samples as possible. It's just the beginning for audio. One thing that's different from Suno is that they're able to continue songs. So all of these models, they generate a song of around 30 seconds. But then if you like it, you can then continue. You can do remixes. They also focus on, uh, they're allowing you to do intros and outros as well, which as you know, sometimes like these model generates like segments of music and it sucks. And one last thing that I wanted to highlight, one last absolute last thing, it's ridiculous. It can do comedy. So listen to this. This is, this is AI generated music based on probably diffusion models for audio. This is not, you know, this is not text to speech. This is a diffusion model generating uh, something that sounds like like this. My belt holds up my pants, and my pants have belt loops that hold up the belt. What the fuck's really going on down there? Who is the real hero? The left track is incredible to me. Leg arms says that she slept for 10 days, but that would be too long. My friend asked me if I wanted a frozen banana. I said, no, but I want a regular banana later. So, yeah. Just to, again, highlight what the hell we just experienced. This is not, this is probably LLM written like something, right? But the left track is generated by this musical thing. They probably have just a lot of distribution. Nobody knows where they took the training data from, probably YouTube. But this generates like a full on stand up comedy with the left track and left track is reactionary to his punchline, which I found just incredible. It's not like music. The, these models are probably doing diffusion. So they're, they're reaching into the latent space and pulling this out from somewhere. And basically, that's the thing that I wanted to end on in, in the music industry. One, one last thing that I wanted to cover in the voice in audio is that Hagen Face gave us Parler TTS. I'm going to add this in show notes. And we know that in text-to-speech, for example, training on specific voices is not super... Nobody wants to release this first, but we know that even OpenAI has an amazing text-to-speech model that Heijin uses and other people use, but they have they decided not to release uh, something called Audio Engine. But now folks at Hugging Face are giving us an open source inference and training library for high quality text-to-speech model. LDJ, you want to talk about this? Because you, you do have experience in this area. Have you seen the kind of the Risa Parler? I saw your re reaction to this. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty impressed. I've been waiting for something like this for a while. I really wonder what the latency and, and how compute intensive it might end up being. But yeah, just the fact that you can literally just type in a prompt of the type of voice that you want. And then you just, I guess it's two different types of inputs. I guess you feed it like you first, you describe the type of voice that you want. And then the other input is what is the actual text that you want it to say. And I'm really curious for the, the component that you input the type of voice that you want. I wonder if you tell it to not even generate like a human voice. Like if you tell it to, hey, generate audio of like a comedy show where people are laughing, if it ends up maybe doing something similar to what you just showed, Alex, and if it's not possible right now, I'm sure if they add in more training data and modify some certain things, then that's probably a possibility. Yep. So definitely folks who want to try like different TTS stuff, incredible effort from Hug and Face folks and shout out to those folks because many of them are friends of ours. And it's just like the beginning, they call it the V0.1 is a 300 million parameters and only English on 10,000 hours of data. So supposedly they're about to scale this with like a, at least a few orders of magnitude to see how way better they perform as well. I think that's most of the stuff that we should have covered and we're about like two hours in. So I'll, this week has been quite crazy in terms of updates. And with that, I just want to thank everybody here on the stage as well. Yam, thank you for, uh, as always, LDJ. We did miss Nistan for the, I think, first time ever. Nistan, we miss you if you're listening to this, to the recording, because you have to keep up. But everybody else, we had Matt Schumer here before. We have two new guests, uh, Jivu Hong and Noah Lee from Kaist. We had Junaid up here for, and Justin from Quen. And you guys, everybody who tunes in and listens from week to week and sends notes and comments and retweets, I really appreciate all of you significantly. I, I love doing this, and specifically because of the comments as well. So with that... With this amazing week in AI, I just want to say thank you and have a nice Thursday and we'll be back here next week. Actually, no, we're not going to be back here next week because I'm going to be in San Francisco during the conference, but the, we'll probably send out a newsletter. And if the community wants to pick up and create a space, I will definitely like that effort. With that, see you in the next two weeks. Cheers, everyone.
Bye-bye.